Good evening. I'm Pastor Mark Colvo of the Michigan Lutheran Church of Michigan, North Dakota, which is where I'm doing this midweek uh, devotional video from the chancel of the Michigan Lutheran Sanctuary on um, June 7th, 2023. And uh, today, commemoration on our church calendar isn't of some great European saint, as it were, but rather one who is not necessarily of the faith as we know it, but one who figures largely in the history of our nation as far as a man of peace, a man of seeking uh, justice and uh, rightness and uh, looking for our legacy to be one perhaps more of unity if we can pay attention to the Creator. I'm speaking of Chief Seattle. Uh, of course, you know the name Seattle has been a large city in the northwest part of our nation. It was named after this Duhamish and Suquamish uh, chief of back in the uh, 1800s. And uh, so I'll talk just a little bit about him and quote some of his words, which uh, stand large, I think, in uh, thought and um, intention, really, for the peace of our people. But our prayer this day is evening prayer, page 142 of the Lutheran Book of Worship. Jesus Christ is the light of the world the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, for you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart think Find to an evil thing, let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God, in you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we say today for our psalm, psalm number two. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do the peoples mutter empty threats? Why do the kings of the earth rise up in revolt and the princes of plot together against the Lord and against his anointed? Let us break their yoke, they say. Let us cast off their bonds from us. He whose throne is in heaven is laughing. The Lord has them in derision. And he speaks to them in his wrath, and his rage fills them with terror. I myself set, set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Let me announce the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Submit to the Lord with fear, and with trembling bow before him, lest he be angry and you perish, for his wrath is kindled quickly. Happy are they all who take refuge in him. writings or the speech of uh, Chief Seattle is very fairly famous but controversial because um, you know first of course he spoke in that language of his people then it was translated into a kind of a uh, inter uh, tribal uh, language, kind of a trade language that they'd use for trading with the white people. So maybe the white people could understand. And then it was traded, uh, translated into English. And it, it, a lot of it actually what comes down to it is maybe the product of a good writer, but a European writer. <laughs> so maybe the thoughts and the uh, words are uh, kind of lost. Uh, but hopefully what remains captures some of Seattle's intention of what he wanted to say about uh, his legacy and uh, what he leaves to people and where the history is going. Because by the time, you know, Europeans arrive toward the West Coast and and start settling after the big push over the Rockies and such. Um, uh, the, the days are really numbered for any tribes in the, any nations in the uh, United States. Uh, so here he writes, It's a rather lengthy speech. I'm going to choose a part of it. So 
Okay. And he speaks of, of course, the great chief at Washington, probably the, the president. And the sky has wept tears of compassion upon my people for centuries untold, and which to us appears changeless and eternal, may change. Today is fair, tomorrow it may be overcast with clouds. My words are like the stars that never change. Whatever Seattle says, the great chief at Washington can rely upon with as much certainty as he can upon the return of the sun or the seasons. The white chief says that the big chief at Washington sends us greetings of friendship and goodwill. This is kind of him, for we know that he has little need of our friendship in return. His people are many. They are like the grass that covers the vast prairies. My people are few. They resemble the scattering trees of a storm-swept plain. The great, and I presume good, White Chief sends us word that he wishes to buy our land, but is willing to allow us enough to live comfortably. This indeed appears just, even generous, for the red man no longer has rights that he need respect, and the offer may be wise. Also, as we are no longer in need of an extensive country. There was a time when our people covered the land as the waves of a wind-ruffled sea cover its shell-paved floor. But that time long since passed away with the greatness of tribes that are now but a mournful memory. I will not dwell on nor mourn over our untimely decay, nor reproach my pale-faced brothers with hastening it, as we too may have been somewhat to blame. Youth is impulsive when our young men grow angry at some real or imaginary wrong and disfigure their faces with black paint. It denotes that their hearts are black and that they often are cruel and relentless and our old men and our old women are unable to restrain them. Thus it has ever been. Thus it was when the white man began to push our forefathers ever westward. Let us hope that the hostilities between us may never return. We would have everything to lose and nothing to gain. Revenge by young men is considered gain, even at the cost of their own lives. But old men who stay at home in times of war and mothers who have sons to lose know better. Our good father in Washington, for I presume he is now our father as well as yours, since King George has moved its, his boundaries further north. Our great and good father, I say, sends us word that if we do as he desires, he will protect us. His brave warriors will be to us a bristling wall of strength. His wonderful ships of war will fill our harbors so that our ancient enemies far to the northward, the Haidas and the Shimshians will cease to frighten our women, children, and old men. Then in reality, he will be our father and we will be his children. But can that ever be? Your God is not our God. Your God loves your people and hates mine. He folds his strong protecting arms lovingly about the pale face and leads him by the hand as a father leads an infant son but he has forsaken his red children, if they really are his. Our God, the Great Spirit, seems also to have forsaken us. Your God makes your people wax stronger every day. Soon they will fill all the land. Our people are ebbing away like a rapidly receding tide that will never return. The white man's God cannot love our people or he would protect them. They seem to be orphans who can look nowhere for help. How then can he, we be brothers? How can your God become our God and renew our prosperity and awaken our dreams of returning greatness? If we have a common heavenly father, we must be partial. He must be partial. For he came to his, 
pale-faced children. We never saw him. We gave you laws. He gave you laws, but had no word for his red children, whose teeming multitudes once filled this vast continent as stars fill the firmament. No, we two are distinct races with separate origins and separate destinies. There's little in common between us. To us, the ashes of our ancestors are sacred, and their resting place is hallowed ground. You wander far from the graves of your ancestors and seemingly without regret. Your religion was written upon tablets of stone by the iron finger of your God so that you could not forget. The red man could never comprehend or remember it. Our religion is the traditions of our ancestors, the dreams of our old men, given them in solemn hours of the night by the Great Spirit, and the visions of our, our sacraments, as is written in the hearts of our people. Your dead cease to love you, and the land of their nativity as soon as they pass the portals of the tomb and wander away beyond the stars. They are soon forgotten and never return. Our dead never forget this beautiful world that gave them being. They still love its verdant valleys, its murmuring rivers, its magnificent mountains, sequestered vales and verdant lined lakes and bays. And ever yearn in tender fond affection over the lonely hearted living and often return from happy hunting ground to visit, guide, console, and comfort them. Day and night cannot dwell together. The red man has ever fled the approach of the white man as the morning mist flies before the morning sun. However, your proposition seems fair, and I think that my people will accept it and will retire to the reservation you offer them. Then we will dwell apart in peace, for the words of the great white chief seem to be the words of nature speaking to my people out of dense darkness. It matters little where we pass the remnant of our days. They will not be many. The Indian's night promises to be dark. Not a single star of hope hovers above his horizon. Sad voice winds moan in the distance. Grim fate seems to be on the red man's trail. And wherever he will hear the approaching footsteps of his fell destroyer and prepare sol stolidly to meet his doom, as does the wounded doe that hears the approaching footsteps of the hunter. A few more moons, a few more winters, and not one of the descendants of the mighty hosts that once moved over this broad land or lived in happy homes protected by the Great Spirit, will remain to mourn over the graves of a people once more powerful and hopeful than yours. But why should I mourn at the untimely fate of my people? Tribe follows tribe, and nation follows nation, like the waves of the sea. It is the order of nature, and regret is useless. Your time of decay may be distant, but it will surely come. For even the white man whose God walked and talked with him as friend to friend cannot be exempt from the common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We will see. We will ponder your proposition, and when we decide, we will let you know. But should we accept it, I here and now make this condition that we will not be denied the privilege without molestation of visiting at any time the tombs of our ancestors, friends and children. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. Even the rocks, which seem to be dumb and dead as the swelter, as they swelter in the sun along the silent shore, 
thrill with memories of stirring events connected with the lives of my people and the very dust upon which you now stand responds more lovingly to their footsteps than yours. Because it is rich with the blood of our ancestors and our bare feet are conscious of this sympathetic touch. Our departed braves, fond mothers, glad, happy-hearted maidens, and even the little children who lived here and rejoiced here for a brief season will love these somber solitudes and at eventide they greet shadowy returning spirits. And when the last red man shall have perished and the memory of my tribe shall have become a myth among the white men, these shores will swarm with the invisible dead of my tribe. When your children's children think themselves alone in the field, the store or the shop upon the highway, and in the silence of the pathless woods, they will not be alone. In all the earth, there is no place dedicated to solitude. At night, when the streets of your cities and villages are silent, and you think them deserted, they will throng with the returning hosts that once filled them, and still love this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. Let him be just and deal kindly with my people, for the dead are not powerless. Dead, did I say? There is no death, only a change of worlds. Very profound words from Chief Seattle. Words that remind us that as human beings, we are indeed brothers, that we have a common destiny, that we live but a short time on this world, whether as individuals or as nations or as tribes, and that we uh, should not forget that those who have gone before us love this land and their memories, I wouldn't say spirits necessarily, but their memories haunt or inhabit or walk, as it says, this land. And that we should care for one another, whatever our differences, whatever our origins, whatever our race, that we should understand that as human beings, it is the gift of God, whether you call him by the great spirit or the God that writes upon stone, that this is gift, this land, this world, this time is a gift to share, to provide, to respect others, whatever the differences, whatever the thoughts, whatever the um, uh, heritage that we carry in our minds and in our hearts. And so I'll think on these words of Seattle and of many other people, thoughtful people, who have uttered similar sentiments as we seek our way forward in this world, in this country, on this continent. May God ever be with us and direct us during these days. Amen. Let us pray. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, 
being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God through Christ Jesus our Savior, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and yours. I protect and love you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.